hope that you all still have your notebooks from the last video that we did about practicing. We'll use it again today as we role play being reporters, talking about the who, what, when, where, why of practicing scales. Welcome to Learn Jazz Bass with Matt Rabicki. I'm glad that you're here. So we are talking about scales today and the little sort of recording sample that we heard at the beginning was me playing on a great tune called Chelsea Bridge that we'll talk about in a second. And I just wanted to sort of be providing some sort of musical context for using scales in thinking about our improvisation and of course our bass lines too. But I was definitely thinking about scales as I was improvising those short melodies that we were playing. So, like I said, we're going to be thinking about the who, what, when, where, why of scales. I had a lot of questions after my last video about practicing, about practicing scales specifically. And I thought, uh, why not address this sort of broad issue that we all have to deal with, right? So, we know we're sort of supposed to practice scales, but I think we need to sort of take a 10,000 foot view and start to think about some questions. What are they for? Why are we practicing them? When is it appropriate to use them? Where are we going to use them in a song? Um, who <laughs> cares, right? Um, so those are the kinds of reporter questions that we need to answer. As we've mentioned before, and in the last video too, we want to think about technique and content. And this is content. Scales are content in a sense, but they are not vocabulary, right? They're you might say they're the, the, the words of a language or the letters of a language, but they are not language themselves. So while it is sort of raw data content, it's not vocabulary content. But they are useful in creating actual vocabulary. And they have a host of other tool, a host of other uses as a tool to practice technique. So it's sort of like informing both content and technique. And we can emphasize one of those over the other in certain aspects of when we think about playing the scales. So included in the PDFs below, I've got a list of 29 written out common jazz scales. There are many, many, many more. These are the most common scales that you will encounter in your jazz playing and I think the most useful. I wouldn't expect you to know them all right, at, right off the bat, especially if you're at the beginning of your journey. Nonetheless, it's important that you are familiar with them as you go on your learning process and on your learning journey. Also available is all of these 29 scales in every key, um, it, written out in every key, if that's helpful to you. Um, you, you can see on the, the scales themselves, I've also put the sort of um, uh, recipe for them. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is a basic major scale, right? And I wanted to remind you, all the numbers are in relation to thinking of the root of whatever we're talking about as a major scale, the root of a major scale. So if we are analyzing a D flat seven sharp 11, and we're using numbers one, three, five, flat seven. Everything is in relation to thinking about D flat major. Now the possibilities of how to practice these scales are nearly limitless. In fact, I did some math based on that scale tree that I've shown you um, in the previous video about practicing. And we'll talk about this a little more in a second, but I did some math based on the possibilities of that scale. And I think if I'm not mistaken, that there are 9.93 times one sextillion operations possible of combinations, I should say, not operations, combinations of these variables in how we practice scales. So um, there's not enough time <laughs> to do that all, but hopefully this inspires you to say, hey, there's a lot of possibilities for making my practice routine interesting. We also know that practicing scales can be kind of boring, right? And so at least that's the perception. And so we're asking, can you make this interesting for me? You know, and which is understandable. I, I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all. And I'm going to try to give you some interesting ways of doing it. But having 9.93 times one sextillion options um, should sort of inspire you to realize that there's lots of things that you can do. Like we talked about with practicing in general, you can use your creativity to come up with some different ways to practice this stuff, right? So before choosing the options of like, combining these nine sextillion things into different choices that we can play with. Um, 
we need to first really internalize the scale that we've chosen. When we're talking about internalizing scales, we mean to really be able to hear them in your head, recall them on a dime, right? Because that's what's called upon us, what we're called upon to do as we're improvising. So we really need to be familiar with them in a really, really deep and profound way. And one great way to try to get to that is to be able to sing along with the scales as you're playing them, sing with your instrument and without. Uh, if I play a C melodic minor scale, which I'm using for all my examples today, uh, and try to sort of hum, sing along with it. That definitely helps to reinforce that sound in your ear. Again, away from your instrument too is very helpful. Additionally, as you're playing the scale slowly, when you first start learning them, remember to play slowly, really try to hear the next note that's coming before you play it. So if this is my first note, and the next note is I wanna really hear that in my head before I play it. And the next note is and so on, right? So really listen, pay attention, as you see, I close my eyes. I'm really honestly trying to hear it before I play it. That's gonna be really, really critical to being able to um, adopt, internalize, make this scale your own. And there are, of course, specific things that we can do um, to play, not just with our ear, to help to really solidify and internalize that scale. Um, here is an exercise that I've included in the PDF that is a series of essentially 14 steps um, sort of double because you should really repeat the 14 steps going the opposite direction of each part. <laughs> so it's sort of 28 steps. But if you do this, I guarantee a scale is gonna get in your ear. Also, I wanna make an, a special note that this is also exactly one-to-one -one applicable for learning the chords to a song. So if you're memorizing a song, the chords to a song, um, this is the perfect way to do it as well. Uh, and again, I promise it's gonna be very, very helpful. So the first couple steps have to do with um, emphasizing the important notes in any given chord, which are the third and the seventh. Those are really the color notes of a given chord. So we wanna emphasize that sound in the scale that we're playing. So if we're using C melodic minor, we wanna emphasize the, the one and the three. That three is a flat three because it's E flat. A natural three would be E natural, so because we're starting on C, so we're thinking this key of C major, flat three is E flat, so one, three, we're emphasizing those notes in some kind of way. I've written out some things for us to, to play, you don't have to do that. The idea is just emphasize that one and three in some kind of way, then emphasize the one and the seven, the root and the seventh. Here, uh, in this scale, it's a natural seventh, actually. It's a minor scale, but with a natural seventh and a natural sixth. Um, so C and B natural, and we're gonna do something to emphasize those as well. Then we're gonna play the first two notes of the scale itself. So we're playing the root and the second degree or root and nine, depending on how you do it. We're playing around with that, right? We're diff in different uh, rhythmic ways and so on. Then after playing the first two notes in some kind of exercise way, we'll, we'll play the first three notes and then the first five notes of the scale. And that's gonna give us a real in into the, the beginning of the sound of it. You can also sort of add stuff to this. Again, be creative. You could, of course, add play the last notes of the scale as one sort of section, right? But now we're jumping into starting to create something related to the chords that exist in a scale. Remember, these things are really in, interlocked. I don't know what came first, <laughs> the chicken you know, the chicken or egg situation. In fact, we know what came first there, it was the egg. Nonetheless, um, they're interlocked. Scales and chords are interlocked. So there is a triad that exists from the root. Here, that would be a minor triad, C, E flat, G. So we're playing with that. And then building from there, we're making the seventh chord that exists there. Here, it's a minor major seven, C. E flat is the flat third, so that makes a minor natural fifth, and then a natural seven. We're playing with that kind of sound. And then next, we're gonna to go to the ninth. That's the second degree. The ninth is a tension that is the second degree above the octave of the root. Then we're finally gonna to get to playing the whole scale up and down. So realize we haven't started, <laughs> right, until this point, actually playing the entire scale. Then we're gonna make the, the sixth chord that is based 
on the root of whatever scale it is. Sometimes it's a major six, sometimes it's a minor six, and so on and so forth. We're gonna do that. And then there's some more combinations of playing to the ninth degree and um, combining sort of the ideas of the scale and a chord mixed up, right? And as I say, these are written out in a certain direction and you can do any direction you want, but um, if you really wanna reinforce the thing, do all the steps again, but reverse the direction that you previously did. And a last note about this particular exercise, certain scales have less or more notes than the C melodic minor scale. So you're gonna to have to adjust the rhythms that you're playing according to how many notes are in the scale itself. Our next idea is something that seems boring, like scales in general, but actually is really, really profound and can provide you with a sort of meditative-like um, scenario where you can examine a bunch of things about your playing, a bunch of different aspects while using the scale and really internalizing it inside you. Um, I was taught this by uh, one of my teachers, Ben Wolf, and so let's call it the slow wolf method. And the reason we say slow is because we're gonna play whole notes with the bow at a slow tempo, 60 beats per minute. And the idea is that we wanna start from the lowest available note of the given scale on the instrument, right? So that's gonna be E or F, unless you have an extension. Um, start from the lowest note, play whole notes, 60 beats per minute, and go to the highest comfortable note that you can, and go back down. 60 beats per minute is pretty slow, and so this can take some time. But what's really great about it is that not only can you really be thinking about the scale itself, but parenthetically, it's also a tool to explore a whole bunch of different things. Your bow sound, you know, technique with your bow, um, understanding the fingerboard, because one neat thing you can do is to try to find different fingerings for a given scale as you practice it. So don't stick to just one way of playing the scale, one fingerings, choose and find interesting ways. You've got a whole bunch of time to think about where to go. So that teaches you about the fingerboard too. You can think about your left hand technique and so on and so forth. Think about intonation, right? There's a bunch of things you can think about at this slow tempo. So let me put the metronome on 60 here real quick and we'll play just a little bit of this ex exercise so that we can sort of hear what it sounds like. Um, it's not complicated at all, right? But we're doing C melodic minor as always. And so our lowest note to start is gonna be F. And so we're gonna play whole notes with the bow. One, two, three, four. So I gotta think about what notes are next. Try to play them in tune. Here I'm thinking about my bow speed, how much bow I'm using. I'm doing a basic fingering here, but I could change it. And so on and so forth. So as you can tell, that can go on for quite a while, right? But it's gonna be really, really effective in getting you inside the sound of the scale. And remember, we're trying to memorize the sound of it as well. So this can help with that, even though you're starting on that lowest note. Give it a try. Another critical element to being able to adopt and sort of um, feel ownership of a particular scale is to be able to apply it as soon as possible in a musical context. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you are playing a big gig at, at Jazz Lincoln Center. <laughs> you, it can be playing along with a, you know, with a play along. Um, I know that's what a lot of us have to do. And despite not having live musicians there with you, as an example, it will still be very, very effective if you're able to take the information, this data, right, that we're taking in and try and put it in a musical context sooner rather than later, as soon as you can. So, in the PDF here, I've chosen the song Chelsea Bridge that I played at the very beginning of the video because the chords are minor major chords and there's a couple of them and that really accepts the melodic minor scale very well. It's a very good sound with a minor major chord. Now in the beginning of the video, I actually um, transposed the key so that the first chord was a C minor major seven because that was the scale I picked before I started to do the video and sort of based everything off that. So. Anyway, but you'll see in the PDF, um, I'm applying the melodic minor scales 
on the B flat minor seven, B flat minor major seven and A flat minor major seven, even just playing them just in time is effective. Obviously you wanna to get to actually creating melodies as soon as possible, but putting them in that musical context is gonna make a huge bit of difference. A little exercise that I came up with that I haven't seen anybody else do is something I call the collapsing scale. And it's just a way of changing parameters that we think about this sort of repetitive thing that we've got to do, right? All the reps that we've got to put in. So the idea is similar to the slow wolf method, but it's not slow, uh, but it is the same in that we want to start with the lowest note available on the instrument from whatever scale we've chosen and end at a high note that we're comfortable with. But what's different, so we go up and then back down. What's different is that when we come back down, the next pass will start from the next highest note and end before the highest note there at the in thumb position. So a real quick example, using C melodic minor, F is our lowest note. G, A. So let's say I'm stopping at C, coming back down. And now, here I'm about to play G to go back to F, but we're not gonna do that. G is gonna be our next starting note. So this is the next pass. I'm starting on G. And now I'm gonna stop at B. Before I stopped at C above in thumb position, here I'm stopping at B. And now I'm about to play A. This now is the, the start of the next pass. and so on and so forth. So the length of the scale gets shorter and shorter and shorter. It's just a way to force you to think, which is helpful when you're doing something that can be mind numbing. And of course, scale patterns can be super helpful. Now, normally, um, you know, we think about, and, and I use in an example later on, just sort of consecutive notes in a scale. So one, two, three, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. That's what I do later. <laughs> in other words, instead of going one, two, three, four, five, why not mix up the numbers? Um, and so for the example I have in the PDF, we're doing one, six, four, five, two. Now, importantly, I wanna make a point that you are doing this pattern in each mode. So starting from each note of the scale. So C melodic minor again, one, six, four, five, two, right? The next thing we're gonna do is start that series of intervals from D, which is the next note in C melodic minor, but that six and that four and five and so on, those, those the, the quality of that, whether it's flat or sharp or natural, is gonna change depending on where you are. So you're still choosing only the notes from the scale. You're not choosing a natural six and a natural four and a natural five and everything, you are using the notes that exist in the scale. So the first is, starting again, C is one, A six, F is four, G is five, D is two. Now we're gonna start that pattern, one, six, four, five, two, on D, and D becomes one. So one, and now the six is B, the four is G, the five is A, uh, the uh, uh, two <laughs> is E flat. So one, six, four, five, two, because I'm choosing the notes from the scale that we're working on. The next thing would be E flat. E flat is now one, C is six, uh, uh, A flat would be natural four, but we don't have that, we've got A natural. So there's that, and then five, it's not a natural five, it's a sharp five, B natural. We're choosing the notes from the scale, and then two is F. Those are gonna give you some interesting ideas. I hope that kind of makes sense. I know that I'm talking a little bit fast, I'm trying to not go on and on and on in these videos. But nonetheless, finding some kind of pattern that sounds interesting to you to start and then working it through the scale is going to not only provide you with perhaps some melodic ideas, but is definitely going to reinforce all the information about the scale that we need. 
also in the interest of keeping things interesting, we can of course try and sort of gamify playing scales, right? Um, somebody had a great suggestion on the last video about practicing that I absolutely just really fell in love with, which was like, um, I have to review it, but it's something to the effect of sort of putting note cards in a box and sort of randomly picking them out and keeping score, something to that effect. It, it was really like a game that they made for practicing, which is great. And we can do this with practicing scales too, of course. In fact, there actually is a website that um, deals with a lot of cre uh, creating random lists of things that I was already set up to do jazz scales, which is really interesting. I'll put a link in the uh, description below. So this is really funny to, um, it gi only gives you a hundred results total at any given time, but it's a randomizer, but works with jazz scales. So I think that's pretty neat. Um, and what we can do, uh, it, it certainly is randomize all these options that we have and when we talk about the things that are in this practice tree, so to speak, right? There's so many options there um, to play with. So we can make a game of randomizing it. We can also make a game of something that is a very, very effective tool, which is the sort of perfection uh, game, which I just called it that just now. Uh, the idea is that you, when you are playing something, a scale, a passage, whatever it is you're trying to do, you want to do it 10 times perfectly in a row. And the little trick here is that when you make a mistake, you don't continue on, you go back to one. So if I'm not uh, able to make 10 perfect passes of this thing I'm trying to do, you start again at one. So it is a very frustrating but effective <laughs> way of trying to force yourself and sort of make it a little bit of a game to really, really learn something. So try to play that scale 10 times perfectly in a row and see what happens. As you've surely gathered from what we've talked about already and like I talked about at the beginning of the video, scales can also be a great tool to explore other things about our musicianship, our technique, our time and so on. So you can really, really um, force the scale into a bunch of different molds, so to speak, that you want to work on. Um, there is time and rhythm, like I talked about, so metronome games with that particular scale. Um, there are technical things, right hand technique, getting a great sound, um, working on playing fast with your right hand, right? Working on two fingers with that particular scale. We've got fingerboard knowledge, like learning where the notes are, ear training, left hand technique, working on articulations, slurs and hammer-ons and so on and so forth, phrasing, all that kind of stuff. There are so many things that are aspects of our musicianship that we can put through this lens of using a given scale, whatever it is that you're trying to learn and trying to practice. Um, many of these are covered in this practice tree that we used, right? So um, thinking about that tree again and, and going back to that original idea of the sextillions of options that are possible, let's just choose a few examples of combining some of these things from the tree. So we're sort of picking fruit from the tree. Um, and we're gonna combine several things that are characteristics of musical playing that we wanna work on. So in example one, um, we're talking about the, uh, the, the, the direction, for example. We're, we're ch choosing that it is ascending and then descending. Um, we've got eighth note triplets there are, um, that, that's a rhythmic choice, right? We've got an articulation, we're gonna slur the first two eighth notes of the triplet. We've got uh, a three, four, we're chosen the meter of being three, four. We're in the low to middle register. Um, we're starting from the fourth degree of the C melodic minor. Uh, so all these kinds of things adding together gives us um, an exercise that probably hasn't been created before just by combining some of these options. Let's take a quick listen to what that might sound like real quick. So again, we've got a metronome marking here of a very medium tempo at 110. We're in 3-4. We're going to be playing C melodic minor, but starting from F, slurring the first two notes. Let's start the metronome and see what it sounds like. One, two, three. So as you can see, it's nothing really complex, but hopefully it provides some interest for you to choose these things on for yourself and choose all these combinations and try to make something interesting that you wanna play. 
To that end, let's look at the second example, which um, basically, again, combines a bunch of different things. We're in 5-4 this time. We're gonna play it very, very slow. We're gonna play regular eighth notes. We're gonna play them all long, legato. We're gonna change dynamics. One measure will be quiet, the next measure will be loud. Um, we're gonna play everything with one finger on our right hand. Uh, and um, we're gonna play from the low on the instrument to high on the instrument. Um, we're gonna, the direction of the notes themselves, we're um, playing a, uh, the triad that is based on the root of the scale, so a C minor triad, but in second inversion. So we're starting from G, and we're gonna play that up, up, and then down, down, and then we're gonna repeat that an octave higher. Sounds super complicated, doesn't sound that complicated, uh, except that this three note pattern goes kind of weird over the bar lines. So let's uh, start this metronome on 40 and hear what it sounds like with all these different kinds of variables. Um, I'll count three and four and five and quiet. As you can tell, it doesn't sound super complicated, but giving yourself all those kinds of parameters certainly make practicing something related to the scale interesting, which is the point, right? So for our last example of the many, many options that we can pick from that uh, scale tree, um, we've got a scale sequence that I talked about earlier. And what we're gonna do is use the C melodic minor scale and play one, two, three, two, three, four, four, five, six, five, six, seven, and so on and so forth. Now we're gonna accent every third note that has something to do with articulation, section of the tree, and that also causes a rhythmic, we're gonna use eighth notes, and um, grouping them in three is gonna give a little bit of sense of a three against four sort of cross rhythm or polyrhythm, that's in the rhythm section of the tree. Um, we're gonna start on the end of one, a little bit of phrasing there, and then um, the last note of the, uh, the uh, um, um, harmonic G is a whole note. So we're talking about sort of phrasing there. And then as far as the feel and meter and so on, we're in 4-4. Four, four. Uh, it's a medium swing. Um, we're gonna use just one finger on our right hand uh, as the parameters that we're gonna use for this particular example. So rather than use a metronome, I'll just count it off here. One and two and three and four and... <clears throat> and so on and so forth. So these are short things, of course, but um, when you are learning a scale, giving yourself a bunch of these parameters not only helps you learn it and internalize it, but all these different kinds of things we've been talking about give some interest to scales that you just wanna sort of drill, right? You need more repetitions on a particular scale. All these things are gonna provide you with a context that should be more interesting than simply running it root to root, up and down, up and down, up and down. That'll drive anybody crazy. So I hope that all these things that we talked about will inspire you, not only to go out and practice, but to create your own exercises for practicing this content and technique that we talked about. Thanks for joining me today. I'm glad that you were able to make it to the end of the video. Please like and subscribe, look for that PDF below. And always remember, straight ahead and strive for tone.